So we've talked about a lot of stuff this semester, a lot of things that I think are super cool, a lot of neat things. Um, clearly, sometimes when we talk about the management challenges, and I tend to emphasize the challenges, it can seem dark and depressing, like when we talked about climate change last time, right? I think everybody went and was ready to go uh, drink cyanide or something horrible. After that. <laughs> Right? I, I heard a lot of very depressed comments afterwards. So I wasn't trying to depress anybody, but, but uh, there are some clear challenges in front of us. Today I want to talk about a couple examples of hope. Try, I try to pull on a, a, some of the things that you guys asked me to ask about. I, we're a bit limited in time here, so I couldn't get to everything. But absolutely, if you guys want me to talk about more things when I finish this quick run through, happy to, um, to, to answer your guys' questions. We do need to leave time to go through um, our last bit of stuff here, but um, there we go. So there's ample reason to hope, right? When the glass is half full or half empty, we could be pessimistic, we could be optimistic, and I really do think there is reason to hope, right? There's, there's a lot of things that seem to be um, working in ways that we hadn't uh, really predicted or, or weren't sure if they were going to play out the way they have. There's lots of, lots of cool things going on. Just a, a handful of these um, that we've talked about or touched on most of these, not all, but most of these. Coastal water quality, incredible success story here in California. Fantastic success story. I think it's, it's part of our human nature that we tend to focus on the amount that has yet to be improved as opposed to the amount that we've actually achieved. Um, and that's, that's good in the sense that we're, we're still wanting to strive for better we're still we're still not satisfied and that's great but it's it's important to make sure that we're looking back with the proper perspective um, so coastal water quality a clear sign of hope and a clear um, piece of evidence showing that we can indeed choose to improve our condition from a degraded state the ozone hole I'll tell you what happened with that 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 was when I was in your guys' position, um, the story of the ozone hole. Um, combating invasive species. Again, we sometimes think, oh my god, we're battling the sea of invaders and all this non-native Eurasian grasses here and all this and that. True, but we actually, there, there, are, there are bright spots. There are, there are success stories there. Um, uh, the California Coastal Act, I would suggest, is a, is a very uh, bright spot in terms of our management of the coastal zone here in California. Is it perfect? No. Can we improve it? Sure. But compared to our colleagues and friends around the world that don't have a coastal act, we are far better. For all the problems that this causes with developers and permitting and stuff, um, I would argue, all things being equal, better to have these challenges that we, that we do have rather than to not have this particular framework and, and management structure around. And then I would say there, there's reason to hope with fisheries. Right? We, we typically talk about fisheries being massively over harvested, and they are. But it's not as if we, we have no tools in the toolbox to respond to that. We do. Again, this is going to be a very brief summary. I would start with a reminder, and let's start with water quality. Let's start with a reminder here. Things used to be pretty messed up. This is a Huntington Beach about 100 years or so ago. Check it out. What a beautiful coastline. Every single one of those is a different oil derrick extracting uh, oil and gas, right? So there's clearly the issues of uh, you know, potential exposure to oil spills and all this and that, but also just, just the, the, the basic blight of all these things when we want to go to the beach, right? We don't see that anymore when we go there. Now there's other development there, but let's not forget the progress that we've made. Even in the context of extracting resources from the ground, we can do the, uh, the equivalent of what all these things are doing now with a single well. right? So maybe we would wish that we weren't extracting any oil from the ground. That would be great. But again, we have made improvements here. We're not doing things the way we used to do them, at least in this country. I was looking for a, a paper I found this summer. I, I, can't, I couldn't find the, the image from it, so I apologize. But this is something similar. It's from the same era. This is 1920s. This is Santa Monica Bay. And this is uh, the folks going to the ocean in Santa Monica Bay on a, on a weekend, right? There's a lot of people there. A lot of people there. Just a little, not, not this 
not this exact time, but about five, seven years later after this photo was taken, uh, this report I have, which was on the sewage, uh, what, an area that would become the area out in front of the Hyperion sewage treatment plant, so the middle of Santa Monica Bay, uh, you know, El Segundo, Manhattan Beach, that area of Los Angeles. And uh, the report was about how much oil and grease would daily wash up on the beach. Not grease, not meaning oily water, I mean grease from cooking. Because all that stuff flushed directly into Santa Monica Bay. And when the tides came in, it brought that. And it didn't just bring grease, it brought everything else that came out of the house. One of the reports was of a lifeguard. Again, this is, it's, it's, a, it's you know, I don't know, eight miles south of where this picture is taken. There was no picture of this, but the, the narrative was lifeguard saw somebody in the water, probably gagging on the, on the turd water and all that kind of good stuff that was out there. Lifeguard jumped in the water, grabbed the person, came out, and within two days came down with typhoid fever. Right? That's in our open coastal area, not some backwater, not some slow moving water, straight up, you know, exposed to the winds and the surge. Water quality was really, really bad. Uh, my wife's uncle, who's a surfboard shaper, um, he used to tell us that when they would go out surfing in, in the you know, greater Los Angeles coastline, or whatever that was, 50 years ago or something like that, um, it, uh, you'd have to dodge the human waste in the breaking in the water, right? We've come a long way. Are we perfect? No. Do we have microplastics and all these other contaminants of emerging concern? Of course we do. And those are real threats. I'm not trying to say those aren't a problem. I'm not trying to be Pollyannish here. But, man, no turds floating in the water. That's a good thing. Several of the places I work around the world still have that situation, right? Massive cholera outbreaks in Haiti and places like that. We know how to do this. Whether we have the resolve or not is another question, but, but don't forget that we do know how to solve stuff. We do know how to respond to these. We can improve, for example, coastal water quality. Next, I want to tell you guys about the dire situation that I experienced when I was in your, um, your shoes. The very first, well, I had a DJ business and radio show and stuff, but, but the, the first real academic job I had in college was working for a bag manufacturer in uh, downtown Santa Barbara who makes, it made, you know, uh, um, messenger bags, things like that, backpacks. And they had a catalog, and every year in their catalog, they um, would, would, you know, so it was, it was a catalog of product uh, before the internet. It actually were printed catalogs, I know it's ancient history. Um, but uh, in the middle, centerfold, called the centerfold, the centerfold of the catalog, where if you just laid the catalog on the, on the table where it would naturally flop open to, they would always put some kind of um, uh, environmental message, some something there about learn about your rivers or forests or whatever. So uh, they decided they wanted to do this particular uh, year's centerfold on the ozone hole. And so they contacted uh, my institution, UCSB, and they said, hey, we need some, like, do a report, maybe we'll give you guys some money, maybe some undergrads can work on this report. So I worked on that report. And it was scary. It was scary. So the ozone hole, it, at that time, it didn't seem like we could stop it. it. Didn't seem like we could stop it. So this is the deal. So um, what's going on here is we have some compounds. In this case, we have uh, ozone, which is the, the three, um, three element version, three molecule version of oxygen. So the two uh, O2 is a typical form we have in our um, atmosphere. When chlorine gets it, gets at it, chlorine can actually pull off one of those third uh, oxygens and essentially make it just regular oxygen. Why does that matter? That matters because this trivalent, this, this triple oxygen that's up in the atmosphere, up in the high atmosphere, 
acts as a UV energy absorber. So when this UV energy comes in, that otherwise would cause us lots of problems, cause lots of cancers, lots of mutations, the ozone is essentially a blanket, an, an insulator that's going to absorb most of that UV energy from the sun. So this ozone layer is a natural protective barrier that we have going on. We were messing with it. We were messing with it because we invented some things that, just like we talked about DDT, we thought they were great. They seemed awesome. They seemed to respond to a problem and yet cause no problem. These were these compounds, chlorofluorocarbons, usually abbreviated CFCs, that were fantastically inert, amazingly inert. And so they were great, right? Because, hey, they didn't cause any effect on, on your body. They didn't cause any effect on the bugs and the plants. Awesome. So we started using them. One of the main uses was in refrigerants. So essentially all of our refrigerators, freezers, chillers, those types of things utilized chlorofluorocarbons. And, and then and similar, car, similar compounds were in a lot of our uh, fire retardant materials, stuff that, that um, um, uh, firemen would use and things of that nature. So these seem to be great products. The problem was they were so stable the stability was the problem. And they were so stable that they would not mess with you and not mess with me. And there would be no biological activity that could really degrade these things, typically speaking. So then they basically spread throughout the entirety of the planet. Spread to the water, spread to the air, etc. No real problems in the water, per se. But when they got into the upper atmosphere and UV radiation can hit them, they broke off one of these chlorine molecules and we started getting that issue of, of a, a deletion of the triple form of oxygen, instead just having the um, O2 form of oxygen. Now, this seemed to be a background thing, this seemed to not be that big a deal, that ozone scavenging aspect of chlorofluorocarbons it's kind of a problem. Then we started realizing that in certain areas it was more problematic. Where was it problematic? It was problematic over the South Pole. It was problematic over Antarctica. Took us a while. Um, some folks won some Nobel Prizes for figuring out how this worked. Long, long story short is above Antarctica during the austral winter, there's no sun, right? We, we've talked about this. It's cold. Sea ice expands. Uh, depending on where we are, it could be dark 24 hours a day around the Antarctic continent. And as we mentioned before, we have this cycling that's going on. Uh, surface waters and atmospheric uh, circulation tend to cut off Antarctica, and it tends to be a separate body from the rest of the planet, atmospherically speaking, surface water speaking. So it turns out what's happening is in the wintertime, all these chlorofluorocarbons are building up, okay? And it's super quiet. It's super quiet and, 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 uh, and no sun. So there's no, act, there's no activity. So the chlorofluorocarbons tend to build up in a higher concentration. They're not being broken down as they are elsewhere on the planet. And then we know now it's the surface chemistry of the clouds. So now we have all these, these cold, dark areas. We have this, these CFCs that essentially are, are on the edges of these clouds. And then when the sun comes up and the sun hits these clouds, massively ma magnified. So instead of just causing some problems, all of a sudden it's this massive consumption of ozone. And it creates a massive thinning of the ozone. All it does is thin. The media have portrayed it as a hole. It's not technically a hole. It's just a massive decrease. And so this is, for example, this is this year's story about this. Let's go back to here. So here we go. So we're looking at animation here. And so uh, we're looking at July. And you'll see, so the hole is getting bigger and bigger, right? So that's this big thinning of the ozone, meaning massive penetration of UV through that down onto the surface. Now we know most of Antarctica is, and that part of Antarctica is basically snow and ice, so it's not, not the end of the world per se there, but the ozone hole was expanding. In the 80s, we were seeing it expand every year, such that Australia was freaking out. The estimates of the increased rates of skin cancer in Australia were going through the roof. There was very real concern this would destroy the surface water um, 
productivity in Antarctica, all the algae and then all the krill and the whales and everything, and it was showing no signs of stopping. It was getting farther and farther, growing farther and farther from Antarctica every austral spring. And dire predictions. Chlorofluorocarbons, very cheap. Dow Chemical, the, the company that was producing most of them, no, there's no problem here. There's no problem here. Scientists are saying, oh my, tell me if this sounds familiar. There's, there's actually problems with this. We've got to do something. We've got to do something. No, no, no. Can't do anything. No, no, no. Going to mess with the industry. No, no, no. Going to hurt the economy. And then when the evidence started mounting, the answer was, oh, what? You're gonna, you don't want people to have refrigerators? What are you, anti the developing world? All you developed world have all these refrigerants and all that. You guys love ice cream and ice and your drinks and all this and that. And now you want to deny the, the poor folks in China and India? You want to deny them refrigeration? That's a really arrogant arrogant imperialistic thing, right? So they went through that phase. All of this stuff. Short version is we actually came together as adults and signed what we call the Montreal Protocol. The Montreal Protocol set up binding uh, targets for us to phase out the use of chlorofluorocarbons. A massive success. So the largest ozone hole we've seen so far is 2015, but that was an aberrant. That, that, that was caused by a lot of these different uh, compounds that come from volcanoes. We are on the mend. We are on the mend, such that by the current estimates are by 2040, we should have an ozone hole uh, the scale that it was in 1980, and it's going to continue to get better. So like so many of these, these oceanic atmospheric situations, we don't just turn off the switch. It doesn't just stop. We have these compounds surrounding us in the atmosphere. So there's, there's some inertia. There's a lot of inertia in the system. It will take a while to recover. But we are recovering. We did it. One of the challenges we're facing now is one of the compounds we replace chlorofluorocarbons with are a very potent greenhouse gas. So now we're, we're dealing with that. But the point is, very dire. Everybody in the world has to agree to it. Is that really going to happen? What if America agrees to it and then China says, screw that, we're not going to, we're going to do our own thing, right? That did not happen. We faced a problem that looked incredibly scary, incredibly worrisome, and we solved it and we went forward. So there is hope to deal with these large scale um, challenges as we go forward. Uh, our friend, uh, my friend Dave Kushner gave a talk in, in Dr. Steele's conservation biology class yesterday, and I, I'm borrowing a couple slides from him. Um, but he was speaking about, amongst other things, I have some other slides in a little bit, but, but he was speaking about invasives. And this is, in this case, this is, a, um, this is a species that I worked on for my PhD. And this is uh, a sargassum that's out here. And uh, it was exploding like crazy. And we thought it was going to destroy the world. By the time I started on my PhD research in the 90s, mid 90s, it was still there. It's, it's still there now. It's relatively chill. It has not destroyed the world. It has not taken over everything. It's there. It's, 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 it's become part of the ecosystem here in Southern California. So just because we have some of these things doesn't necessarily mean that it's always going to lead to the the end of the world. <clears throat> the current challenge is this thing up here on the left, this brown alga, this kelp uh, called Undaria. And that is starting to show up all over the place. And there's a lot of worry. Uh, it's now showed up out at the Channel Islands. I'll get back online. <clears throat> OK, so uh, this non-native potentially problematic invader, potentially an invader that might come in and radically change the ecosystem of our, of our uh, kelp, offshore kelp beds here in Southern California. Uh, this summer, the kelp forest monitoring team from the National Park Service found some Undaria out in the wild, out in the open coast. And so I think this is an uh, example of hope because the Park Service is considering trying to go eradicate it. Maybe we won't, but, but the very fact that we actually have some monitoring programs out there that are sentinel that can catch these things, we don't always catch everything, but 
but at least we have a shot at catching these things. And we're actually having a discussion. Do we want to try to go out and eradicate in an open ocean ecosystem a current dispersed, widely dispersing alga? That's crazy. That's awesome. The fact that we're even discussing that is a huge, massive improvement. We are not at the place we were 30 years ago when we would find some invasive species like this and I would give a talk about it or someone like me would give a talk about it and everybody would go, ho-hum, life's so horrible, we can't do anything. We actually have tools to respond to this. We have policies. We have buckets of money, maybe not as much as we'd like, but it's, it is an improvement. We have been getting better in terms of how we're trying to deal with problematic or organisms um, here in California and beyond. Uh, n another success is the California Coastal Act. Again, an um, incredibly powerful tool to manage the coast. Some folks are unhappy with it. It's far from perfect. But for example, I uh, happened to be at, at uh, uh, an expensive restaurant in Malibu because it, uh, it was a whole long story, but basically it had a gift certificate, so we're at an expensive restaurant. And uh, because uh, my wife and I were uh, childless for the weekend, we were uh, attempting to have a date weekend, right? Which I know it sounds strange, but, but we're having a date weekend. And we went, we're drinking. And so it was very interesting because I was with a group of folks that um, didn't know who I was and uh, et cetera. And as we were walking into the restaurant, I saw this sign. So this is on, this is on the entrance to the, uh, the, the, parking, uh, park, uh, the parking lot. And basically it says, blah, 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 notice of application for coastal development permit. Long story short, this uh, restaurant, which is just off of PCH, right? So not on the beach, but on the, on the, the cliff area of PCH. And, um, a, you know, overlook, it used to be a hotel back in the 70s. It was purchased and turned into this restaurant, very famous restaurant, everything in the, everything in the, I think the cheapest car was like a Bentley or something like that in the, in the parking area, right? It's all it Tesla. Paradise, Paradise Cove? Or? Not Paradise Cove. No, much more expensive than Paradise Cove. I, I don't want to attack any individual business. I'm not trying to name them, but it's south of Paradise Cove. Anywho, um, anywho, so, uh, so, so there is a hotel. There's a hotel. And then the owners purchased it. Uh, quite some time ago and turn it into this high-end restaurant where Johnny Carson would come hang out, all the, all the you know, Hollywood elites and a you know, beautiful view of, of Santa Monica Bay and the Malibu coast, really cool place. Um, and then what started happening is some of the folks that lived down below them asked if they, uh, if they would want to get takeout from this place, right? They're, hey, can we get a whatever to go and this and that? And it was kind of a pain so what the restaurant did was put in a stair stairway down from their level, the level of PCH, down the cliff essentially to the, uh, the, the homes below. And they had that for about seven years. And it was great. It was these private homeowners own free, uh, essentially private boardwalk up the hillside of Malibu. And then a little bit ago, someone figured out what's going on. And they said, uh, by the way, you can't do that uh, in the coastal zone um, without at least providing for public access as well. So what you're seeing right here is, is part of the process that, was, that, that the restaurant was going through. They had to open up their stairway to the public, to you guys, to the unwashed masses. The people that don't pay $50 for a side of lobster or whatever, right? And it was really interesting at the restaurant how much these servers thought this was the worst thing in the world. This is totally horrible. Why? Anybody can come and now access the beach here. This is ridiculous. The public didn't pay for the stairwell. We paid for the stairwell. And I was, I was just, you know, a little bit inebriated at the time, going, really, really, really. I was letting the gentleman talk, and I was like, this is great. i got to tell my students about this. So the point is, not that we want to um, you know, harm some coastal business or anything like that, but we have in place 
when someone puts an access point in where there otherwise is no public access, they have to provide access for you, the general public. We don't want to be jerks. We don't want to endanger people. We don't want to mess with people's privacy. But this coastal resource is all of our resource. It is not the wealthy folks that paid a gazillion million dollars for their house. It's theirs too. It's theirs too, absolutely. But it's not exclusively theirs. So that's a, that's a success. This is a very powerful instrument. And again, we want to be cautious with this. We don't want to be constantly making enemies everywhere we go. But that's great. If we didn't have the Coastal Act, only the wealthy folks would be walking up and down the, the bluffs there, right? So I'm not encouraging you to be riffraff and go cause problems for restaurants, but I'm saying it is a good thing. It is, it is, it is a cool thing. Okay, next, let's talk about the one that we've just finished up to, uh, working on, talking about, our, our seafood surveys. It, you know, we've talked about the fact that so many of our fish stocks around the globe are indeed depleted or being depleted. And again, we've, I've shown you guys graphs like this all the time, and it's just, uh, you know, everything is, was a lot, now, we're, now they're a fraction. You know, 10% of the top predators by biomass in the ocean now. So that, that's a bad thing. And if we, just, if we just left the conversation there, sometimes we take away from that that we can't respond. That, that you know, we're totally inept and everything's just gonna end and oh my God, boo-hoo is us. And uh, the, the typical answers are marine protected areas work. So we gotta only use marine protected areas. We'll talk about that in, in a second. Um, but the other option is just, it seems a lot of people are just burying their head in the sand and saying, oh my God, things are, things are horrible. Oh my God. Um, we can recover species right here in our own backyard. So this example is white sea bass. It's a very popular, um, great taste in fish, very popular fish for spear fishermen, for, for other fishermen. And... Uh, Here is the commercial catch, and it's following that same pattern, right? We go on up, we hit World War II, all the capacity goes up, and then this, this is landings in terms of metric tons. Um, their populations crash, right? So, the, so they were, um, by the early 90s, they were a fraction of what they used to be. Then we instituted some new fishing regulations. In this case, we instituted a gill net ban. In, in our inshore waters. And look at what you start to see. Magically, it doesn't, it's not instant, it takes a couple years, right? Those little babies need to grow from babies to juveniles, juveniles to adults. But, um, but we've seen recovery of these white sea bass. Is it, is it perfect yet? No. Are they recovered to pre-disturbance level? No. But they're getting a lot more common. <clears throat> and and there, there's all kinds of measures for this. But here's one, this is catch per unit effort. Right? We've talked about the standardizing for the amount of effort that we're putting out. And this is what we're seeing with these white sea bass. It's going up and up and up. So if we had some blips, has it gone down a little bit sometimes? Yes, but this species is on a trajectory of recovery. Uh, yeah, right, so same thing. Okay, and, and, and it's continuing on. And so here is the world record white sea bass. There might have been something new in the last couple of years. Yeah. Was that graph showing they're using less energy per fish now? Or they're right, right, right. So the same amount of, that, that, that was saying the same amount of effort is leading to more <coughs> biomass of fish harvested. <coughs> so this is the world record white sea bass now caught in Malibu. In Malibu. Not in some weird for, forsaken place up in Alaska where no one ever goes. In Malibu. Right? So these, so these fisheries management efforts, when properly enforced, when properly calibrated, can indeed work. Can indeed work. Another example are giant sea bass. Right? We used to call black sea bass. Now we call giant sea bass. Um, great talk. If you guys haven't watched it, uh, on our WSN, the WSN videos I put up, there's a great video of um, one of our master students from Northridge swimming around in the bite and actually finding the babies of these and looking at the ecology of the babies of these guys, which are little teeny tiny guys about this big and spotted. They're very cute. They hang out in the sandy beach just, just underneath past the surf zone. 
really cool. So you guys watch that video. She has a lot of uh, cool um, GoPro shots of what these of these little babies look like. But again, this is this is giant sea bass. This is that one that I showed the picture of when we were talking about um, you know change perspectives, historic perspectives that those old ladies were catching on the docks and at, at Magoo Pier before the hurricane took out the pier. Huge top apex predator on our Southern California reefs. This thing ate everything. This sucker would suck in lobsters. This sucker could suck in, suck in squid, whatever, man, eat whatever. And this was a big, this was a toad. This is a huge fish, hundreds of pounds per fish, right? I've only ever seen one that's a juvenile. I've never seen a full adult in the wild, but it made me almost mess my pants underwater. I mean, it was, it looks so big. I mean, it looks like a VW bug. And that guy was probably only, you know, seven or eight years old, 10 years old, something like that. Um, really impressive fish, really impressive fish. Right, so they get big. Uh, again, same story, right? Uh, especially in the wake of World War II, oh my God, let's go harvest these guys, let's take them out. There's another big harvest blip here. Anybody know what happens in the 60s? Early 60s? The banning of... Not banning of anything. Nope, this is here in Southern California. Scuba, the invention of recreational scuba diving that also popularized free diving. And so um, while, while, my, while my spear fishing friends would, can, would might question this, um, clearly spear fishermen had an effect on this species. They're big giant, any one of you with a spear gun could hit one. They don't spook away and they're huge and so that that apex them having no major predators themselves made them um, behave such that they wouldn't you know fly away every time somebody would come near them. They, if somebody got in the water, like what's that? I'm gonna go check that out, right? So they'd swim right up to you. So that appears to be what was driving the spike there. But in, but more specific, more generally, right? Bunch of harvest, boom, population crash. Same thing with. Various shark species, leopard sharks, uh, etc. Same thing. A lot of high, high um, uh, harvest rate in the past, and now that we have but a fraction of the biomass coming in that we we had uh, back in the day. With all of these species, we're seeing higher catch per unit efforts. Right. So, are they recovered yet? No. But all of them are showing signs of improvement. Banning gill nets in this case, which was a very destructive practice, a very non-specific practice, tons of bycatch. By doing that, we've seen improvements in a whole host of nearshore, inshore fish species. Again, it's not perfect, but it's it's pretty cool. Um, and so this is this data is about a decade old now, but suffice it to say, the numbers are continuing to go up. There's a lot of folks that are working specifically on. Uh, measuring this. There's a lot of uh, PhD students right now working on this, but the point is it's all going in the right direction. This is an endangered species in the U.S. Very cool. Okay, and the last, last fisheries example I'll, I'll share with you guys is this notion of um, marine protected areas. So these other fisheries methods can work. MPAs can work. We've talked about examples from other places. Let's look at some examples from, just one example real quick here to finish up, from our um, Channel Islands. So this is, I would argue, an incredibly um, hopeful sign. Let's, let me explain this to you. This is a long-term data set from the Kelp Forest Monitoring Project. Again, I, I borrowed this slide from Dave's talk from yesterday. So we're going from 1980 to, in this case, uh, 2000, but the, the, the pattern has continued on and it's, it's only continuing to get more so. But check it out. So we are looking at sea cucumbers, which are awesome. I like sea cucumbers. A lot of people don't seem to like sea cucumbers, but they're cool. Um, these are slow moving critters, right? They're not, they're not able to escape quickly. And if you guys could go down, we could all harvest this, this room in about a minute, you know, if we're underwater. Very easy to catch. Slow recovery, slow regeneration rates of them. And check it out. So these are areas in white. Those are areas where we've where um, we have access to. Those are areas outside of marine protected areas. The black are areas inside our one of one or more of our marine protected area networks in the Channel Islands. Now, originally, no one fished for these because they look like 
a sea cucumber, right? And we don't typically like them. They're mostly sent to Asia for the Asian markets. But, um, but check it out, 1982, 1984, 1986, there is no fishery for them. So from the perspective of sea cucumbers, inside and outside the marine protected area, doesn't make a difference because nobody's fishing for them. And what we see there is, sure enough, um, we look at the density of these critters in the, on the seafloor, there's no significant difference for a long time, inside or out, they're, just, they're, they're, they're the same amount. Go forward, go forward, go forward. And then we started fishing them. Then we started fishing them. And so as soon as we started fishing them, we start to see divergence. So the black, which are the areas inside the protected areas where they cannot be fished, they maintain this, this high number, right? Still big. The areas where that were outside the reserve that were not protected, their numbers crash and their numbers start to become significantly different and significantly lower than the abundances inside the, the reserve. This is additional data after that. So this is, this is a subset of that, that overall data that I just showed you. But have a look. So here now, the story I told you before was up to here and we saw a divergence. The reserves were staying high with them, in this case symbolized in yellow, but the, um, uh, yeah, the other areas, they, they crashed. Then, as you guys know from our readings, we established in the early 2000s the Marine Protected Area Network around the Channel Islands. So some of these sites got protection. And check out what happens. Instead of, so the black now are sites that uh, were outside of the reserve back in the day and remain outside of a reserve. The red ones were areas that were newly incorporated into a reserve after the 2003 establishment. And check it out. They're, not, they're, they're now equivalent to the old sites. So reserves can have an impact. Reserves can have an impact over the course of just a few years, depending on what, fishery, depending on what species we're talking about. So non-MPA-based methods can recover fish. MPA and, and fisheries, MPAs can recover fish. These are all hopeful signs. These are, these are all really, really um, positive things that we've learned and, and have shown. So the last thing I'll say, and then we gotta get to some more other things, but the last thing I'll say is that you guys are all engaged, right? We did not have a CSUCI 30 years ago, right? Almost all the projects that you guys do for your capstones, for your, your anthropology capstones, your SM capstones, all those things um, actually do make a difference. Do make a difference. Um, we're engaged. This is, this is some of you guys. This is, this is us working on the um, Refugio oil spill, right? We were working on the sites before the oil spill happened. When the oil spill came, we were able to help the oil spill folks out, right? They've started giving us a little bit of support recently, but we did it ourselves, right? We didn't wait for someone to give us a grant to go out and start assessing what's going on to try to help move the ball forward. You guys, um, as a student body, were engaged. And we as a program were engaged. And that's very hopeful. That's very hopeful. So again, when we, we have some of these feelings, sometimes we talk about climate change, whatever, it doesn't seem, doesn't seem good. Do stuff, right? Get out there and get involved, work on stuff, and it's incredibly empowering. If you sit at home, if you just think of all the things that are going wrong in terms of coastal marine management, it's easy to get, get depressed. There, there are a lot of pathways to success, a lot of pathways to improved environmental sustainability, environmental justice, all the kind of stuff that we, we care, about, care about. So that's okay. So there's a little bit of hope for you guys. Don't go away totally depressed. Don't say it depressed you all the time. Only depress you sometimes. Here's here.